I remember when we first met 10 years ago, and as I was introducing her to this weird world of financial independence that I stumbled upon, and uh, she would be upstairs doing her hair or whatever, and I'd be downstairs making dinner, and I'd just be blasting A Simple Path to Wealth as I was like rereading it and re-listening to it. And so between that- Clearly, clearly you weren't planning on a romantic evening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. There's something to that voice, J.L. There is. There's a little bit of Barry White in there. There is. I listen to your Google yeah, but the, talk. But the content needs to be different. <laughs> you got for a second a, career if you ever want to start. For a small fee, I'll put together a tape for you. Yeah. <laughs> JL Collins on OnlyFans. Oh, yes. That's, that's the idea. There it is. Hey, baby. Want to ride my bull market? Oh, yeah. There it is. There we'll get go. you on OnlyFans. <laughs> That's probably going to be the opening of, of, of the podcast. <laughs> There's so much more to money than saving it, spending it, and making it grow. So we're digging deeper and exploring all the topics we only scratch the surface on in our book to uncover how money really affects our lives. I'm Julian. And I'm Kirsten, but most people know us as Rich and Regular. Maybe you've seen us on social media, read about us, or we popped up on your TV one day. The Saunders are rewriting the rules to achieving financial freedom. We're writers and creative entrepreneurs on a mission to inspire better conversations about money. Welcome to Cashing Out, the the podcast. podcast. When you visit New Orleans, you can see with your own two eyes. The city has been through a lot and has the scars to prove it. But when you take the long view, one thing is also clear. The city has always managed to bounce back. Known for both its lively French Quarter and its laid back attitude, New Orleans is sometimes referred to as the Big Easy. I mean, you can literally get daiquiris at the drive through here. But when it comes to investing, presumably nothing is easier than index funds. And who better to talk about that with than the man who wrote a book about it, J.L. Collins. His soothing baritone voice is the one behind the best-selling book and one of our personal faves, The Simple Path to Wealth, which he initially wrote for his daughter. Since then, he's inspired more than just one little girl that makes smarter investing decisions. He's inspired thousands, maybe even millions of people to keep it simple. Hey there. You can hear me? Yeah, you made it. I made it. It's it's I have to say it's so nice to finally meet you. I feel like I already know you and I know, I know. we had exchanges over the years and um I don't know that we've ever been in the same place at the same time though. No, we've never we've never been in, in physically in the real world together. But I we didn't we do an interview together a while back? Or am I am I maybe my mind? maybe I don't know. Um it's been a couple of years. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. I, but yeah, I don't I want to completely rule it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Let's hedge a little oh, bit. <laughs> well, one of us is having a senior moment, and it's most likely me. Because <laughs> um, I was looking for a funny moment to, 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 to sort of dive into, and you kind of laid it out there for me. Mm-hmm. Um but I, I, I will, I'll do this. I'll go back to, because we spoke about like when we first met, that was 10 years ago when we kind of started this journey. Um, and earlier this year, I had a moment where we received our prospectus from Vanguard and we're looking through it. And I, I realized as I was looking at like the 10 year sort of look back as they were talking about performance, I was like, for the very first time, I could say, oh, this is when I bought, right? Because every other time you're kind of, just sort of projecting, you're thinking about it. But at this point, it was the very first time that I could look back and say, wow, like we've actually been investing for over a decade now. Mm-hmm. And it, obviously it's been a very great decade for investors. Um, but I'm curious, because you've been investing, I would imagine, uh, for multiple decades at this point. Um, how do you, what's changed in, in, in your, like, what do you remember probably from the early days of when you started investing versus today? Well, for me personally, the, the biggest thing that changed is I finally got smart enough to embrace index investing. Mm. Um, you know, that took me a, a long time. Uh, you know, the, the irony 
Julian, is that I started investing in 1975, and that's the same year that that uh, Jack Bogle came out with the first index fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, so theoretically, I could have gotten on that train just as it was first leaving the station, but wow. Wow. I didn't. I didn't know about it at the time, and and uh, and but I did hear about it ten years later, like in the mid '80s, and I. I just, like a lot of people that I talk to today, I, I, I just had trouble wrapping my head around the concept that, you know, you could outperform without being active. And uh, so it took me another 10, 15 years before I, I wised up. But yeah, that's probably the, the biggest thing for me. And of course, then, you know, just from the technology point of view and the, you know, when I was first investing, I was buying stocks through a stockbroker. Hmm. That was, you know... Five six percent commission coming and going. I mean, it's just incredible. So yeah, it's it's so much better and easier today than it was. So so this was nineteen ninety, which was nineteen ninety. Well, I, I was trying to do the math in my head about when you when you decided to uh, fully embrace the idea of index fund investing. Oh, when more, did you... more like yeah, more like two thousand. So. Okay. And I don't, and I don't remember exactly, but you know, just very roughly think, you know, I started investing in 75, as I recall, probably around 85, you know, I had a friend who was in the business who was, had started talking about, you know, efficient markets and, and uh, indexing and that kind of thing. And, you know, when I hear people arguing with me about the subject, it's my voice in my head that I hear, right? Cause I made all those arguments back in the day. So it was probably in 85, I started hearing about it. And then, you know, another maybe 95 at the earliest, but probably closer to 2000, you know, and then I, I still, let's see, when was the last, I think I still owned one or two individual stocks as late as 2013, maybe. So even once I, I had indexing doing most of the heavy lifting, I have the disease, right? You know, I think I'm. I, I think I've broken the addiction at this point. It's been about a decade since I've I've owned individual stocks, but but it was tough because there, you know, if you if you uh, pick a stock and it works, mm -hmm. uh, that's intoxicating. I mean, oh, yeah. there are a few things in my experience that are more intoxicating, and so it literally was. Uh, you know, I don't want to overstate it. It's not like being addicted to heroin or something, but it is a kind of addiction that I had to overcome. And I still get tempted, you know, every now and again, I'll, I'll be reading some story about some company and I'll, yeah, maybe I had to take it down there. No. <laughs> 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 Step back off the ledge. I was like, don't, don't pick up that drink. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cookbooks and finance books have a lot in common. They're instructional without being preachy, and the best ones convince you to leave the pages and experience what you read in real life. On the second day of our trip, we had lunch at Turkey and the Wolf. It's a culinary experience for people who like nice things, but hate pretentiousness. When you walk in, there's no one to seat you. And as we made our way to our table, Julian says, This is exactly how a chef thinks. They strip away the fluff and focus on what matters. And that's exactly how we like our investments. Straightforward, proven, and affordable. Even if it is a little cheesy. What do you think, I, I know we describe it as addictive, but what do you think the allure is with individual stock picking? Because people have read our work, they're familiar with your work, they know the value of index funds. And even us, we're still tempted to just right. like, try is it is it just as simple as fun like something a little bit risky or do you think there's a deeper more psychological allure to stock picking I walk when it's time to walk people don't you know ball players who can't play anymore assholes trying to maintain a standard of living not possible anymore a lot of those around wow what a, what a great 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 question <laughs> <laughs> I, so I think there's a lot of it. I mean, I, I always cringe when people say, you know, I, they they enjoy investing or it's fun. I've seen you be half a million dollars up. I've been up two and a half million dollars. What do you got on you? Nothing. What'd you put away? Nothing. 
It's like I, my attitude is I don't expect my money to do anything other than work for me. I don't expect yeah. it to entertain me. I don't see, you know, I, I have other sources of fun, but I get that because when I was an active investor, it was fun. But I think more fundamentally, and maybe I'm, I'm about to describe my own psychology and shouldn't paint with a broad brush, but I think that smart people, and I think I'm one of them, and I think you guys fall into that category, have a lot of trouble wrapping their head around the fact that doing nothing, as Jack Bogle says, is more effective than the effort they can put in. You get up two and a half million dollars. Any asshole in the world knows what to do. You get a house with a 25 year roof, an indestructible Jap economy shitbox. You put the rest into the system at three to five percent to pay your taxes, and that's your base. Get me? That's your fortress of fucking solitude. And that puts you for the rest of your life at a level of fuck you. Right. So mm -hmm. you look at it, and, and this was the argument in my head when I was first resisting indexing, and you say, well, this is insane. I Somebody wants you to do something, fuck you. Boss pisses you off, fuck you. Own your house, have a couple bucks in the bank, don't drink. That's all I have to say to anybody at any social level. I mean, if I buy an index and I buy, you know, the S&P 500 or I buy the total stock market, all I need to do to, to outperform that is just to avoid buying the really bad companies. And I'm certainly smart enough to avoid the bad companies. Or all I need to do is just like buy the few really good companies. And that just seems so reasonable and logical. And, but all the research indicates that it, it doesn't work. And my theory is that, you know, today's, um, you know, today's high flying great company is, is, you know, tomorrow's disaster potentially. And today's yeah. dog is tomorrow's great turnaround story. Uh, Mr. 1500 oh. uh, put up a post, I think yesterday. And he, he, there's some statistic that I wasn't aware of that most publicly traded companies only last 20 years or 21 years. And he made the point that if you're picking individual stocks, you kind of have to res resign yourself to the fact that you're going to outlive most of the companies you invest in. And I didn't know that. I knew there was huge turnover. I mean, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, for instance, those 30 stocks, there's not a single one anymore that, that was on the original list. Uh, the S&P 500 turns over routinely. That's one of the things I love about index funds. They're what I call self-cleansing. So I don't have to worry about what category or what company is going to rise to the top because I'm going to own it. And I'm going to benefit from the, you know, multiple hundreds of percents that it can possibly go up. And those that fade away, I don't have to figure out those either. They'll just fade away on their own. And it's a rigged game because, you know, the most you can lose is 100 percent. But you can gain <laughs> tens of thousands of percent on the upside. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Most people we meet think the hardest part about investing is demystifying financial jargon and finding the money to invest. But that's only half the battle. Because after you've understood the basics and collected your coins, the real work begins. You need to put what you know into action, consistently live out your plan, and confront the inevitable interpersonal conflicts that arise along the way. Sometimes it's your partner. Other times it's family or friends. But wherever the conflict arises, the goal is to not let distractions, temptations, social or peer pressure drown out your inner desires. And when you achieve this sense of harmony, you can roll with the punches. Um, but you said something about when you're arguing with people and uh, I, I, I too argue with people. <laughs> I had uh, a really, and it wasn't really an argument, I, I would call it a heated discussion. How you doing? Fantastic. Fantastic. I hope you have a good day. Hope you have a better week. Mm, I hope your month is full of successful days and a lot of great ventures. I hope you just come up, brother. I hope your whole fucking year is spectacular. Oh, you hope my year is spectacular? Yeah. You got something you want to say? You got something you want to say? We find that we sometimes get lured into, or at least I get lured into <laughs> these conversations about money where people kind of, you know, they want don't want to ask you directly, but they do want you to weigh in because they're either, right. you know, trying to see what you think or pick your brain. Um, and so... 
I, I just stopped and I asked the question. I was like, wh- wh- why do we like, you know, because you got to talk about options trading and, and real estate right. investing and all, all the things like what we found is that people, when they're trying to build wealth, they, 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 it's like they immediately go to the most complicated, the sexiest things, which, with that, whichever voice is the loudest on social media at the time. And uh, he was really talking about like options trading and how right. he made this move based on something he saw in CNBC. And now he's went to this conference and now he's going to get into real estate investing and all these things. And I was like, but you also read our book. You also know who we are, right. what we've done to get to where we are. You know that this really simple, easy, and arguably foolproof option exists. What is it that is alluring you to all of these other things? And that turned into a combus, a, a deep, uh, again, heated argument, an impassioned conversation um, <laughs> that I think teetered on a lot of these other things. But I'm curious, like, do you ever find yourself, like, even after all these years and all the talks and the books? Do you ever find yourself arguing with people who just don't want to listen? <laughs> or is it just me? No, it's not just you. <laughs> 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 so first, first of all, I think you put your finger on it. Uh, you know, it's as to why people are drawn to those things. They're responding to the loudest voices. And the loudest mm. voices out there, you know, are on the media. And they frankly have something to sell. I mean. There's a lot of money to be made convincing people to trade options, for instance, or to trade stocks in general. And that's why those are the loudest voices. There's very little money to be made by investing in index funds by the, you know, by the uh, investment firms. Um, when I was talking about arguing with people, that's more in, in the old days when mm. I was a stock picker and I was on the other side of that argument. Mm. Um, I really don't argue with people about this stuff at all anymore. So what I was referencing is when I, but I still hear and read those arguments. So I know what they are. And as I say, they Mm -hmm. resonate in my own voice in my head, because I made all those same arguments. I mean, I could, I could probably make those arguments better than most people making them today. But I, I decided, you know, when I, started the blog there's only one person i've ever really tried to convince of this path and that's my daughter Hmm. and and job done took a while but job done you know so she's firmly on the path and uh, you know my my approach now is um you know i'll I'll get for instance uh, comments on the blog or on twitter you know and somebody will post a link to an article or or to a, a talk and they'll say you know this guy disagrees with you but tell me why you're right and he's wrong I'm like, well, no i'm not going to spend my time doing that i mean if you want to know what i think uh i've got a book out and i've got a blog with a lot of information on it i've given lots of interviews uh, i've explained myself as clearly as i know how to do I assume this person that you're putting in front of me has explained him or herself as clearly as they are able. So you want to know what I think, read and listen to what I think, read and listen to what that person thinks. And you decide because I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I, you know, I really, I don't, I don't care. I, you know, my information is out there. I'm thrilled when people say, wow, this resonates with me. And, I'm particularly thrilled when people say things like it resonated with me 10 years ago and, you know, it's made a big difference in my life, but I'm not going to fight with you to to get you to accept it. I mean, you know, so that's kind of my, my attitude at this point. Yeah, I agree. We actually don't like the term financial experts for that reason. We prefer to be considered financial role models, because we don't feel like we are a guru in anyone's life. We don't mm-hmm. want that that burden of right. being right. this financial expert about your somebody else's money. Given your position on financial advisors and just kind of the hierarchy in the industry mm-hmm. itself, do you believe in financial experts? Do you consider yourself to be one? 
Wow. <laughs> that's a loaded, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I you know, I I try to make it clear to people that that look, this is what I write about, what I talk mm-hmm. about is this is, you know, I I write and talk about what's worked for me and what's kicked me in the ass. And this is what I tell my daughter to do. I mean, this is the advice I give to my kid. Now, is it applicable to everybody everywhere? No, probably not. Uh, And I was on one of in my Google talk, um, um, the woman who interviewed me, I'm shamefully drawing a blank on her name at the moment, but she asked me at one point, why, why don't other financial writers um, provide such specific advice like you do? Because I, you know, I say, buy BTSAX, that's pretty specific. And I said, well, I can't get into their heads. But the reason I do that is because I'm writing for a specific person, right? <clears throat> and so, you know, you have to extrapolate a little bit if you're going to, if you're going to follow my approach, um, because a broad based total stock market index fund, I prefer VTSAX from Vanguard for a couple of reasons, but you know, that same fund from Fidelity or T Rowe price or, you know, following the same index, that's fine. Uh, I'm just wrapping up uh, my book called Pathfinders which is a collection of stories from people all over the world, all different ages, all different levels of wealth that have told me how they're adapting the principles in the simple path to wealth. And I just think that's fascinating because it's a very U.S. centric book because Mm -hmm. I'm an American. It's a very specific book because it was written for one person and, and she was at the very beginning of her journey. But a lot of people are not at the beginning of their journey. They may, you know, be well into it and have to unwind things they've already done. And so, or they live in a different country that doesn't have access to the same kinds of it. So it's just fascinating to me how people have, have adapted mm-hmm. uh, the basic simple path to wealth that I, that I put out there. You are, you know, I was trying to think of a name, right? And I'm sure you've been called a couple of different things, but in terms oh, of the, a lot of different things. <laughs> the role that you play as a, as a, I, I think of you as the Oracle, right? You're the oh. Oracle. Um, but I, you know, I, I get emotional sometimes when I think about Jack Bogle and that sounds weird. I've never met the guy. I've never met a, a, even a relative of his, but I think about what he did Um uh, certainly compared to what he could have done. Um, exactly. Right. Um, but then when I think about, you know, you and, and I think about some of the other people who have really been at the forefront and our pillars uh, in the financial independence community, I, I wonder if you are ever worried or concerned about this message and this approach ever fading away. And, and if so, like, who do you see, uh, as kind of taking the torch as and, and beating the drum on this message of the importance of index fund investing. That's an interesting take. And, and I've never been, you know, usually the question I'm asked is, do you think index fund is going to index investing is going to take over the world? Hmm. Um, and the answer to that is no, I, I don't, because the allure of trying to outperform as we were talking about earlier with your friend who, you know, mm-hmm. is just drawn into all these other things. That's just too strong and there's too much marketing around that. I never candidly thought about the idea that maybe the flame would be extinguished. Uh, I don't see that happening because there's so much research supporting mm-hmm. uh, the value of index funds and, you know, the low cost approach and the outperformance and, and that kind of thing. So I, I don't, think that's going to happen. You know, uh, Jack Bogle, of course, has passed away at this point. And, and I do see, you know, Vanguard, one of the reasons I'm a huge Vanguard fan is because that was his creation and he structured it so that if you own the funds, you own the company and there's no inherent conflict of interest. But even Vanguard is straying from the one true faith, so to speak, a little bit, oh. you know, they're they, they have actively managed funds and they're pushing them more and more. And, and uh, you know, I think that 
you can see a trajectory of that as as uh, Mr. Bogle uh, grew older and was less actively involved. And mm -hmm. so I, I worry about that a little bit. Uh, but, you know, I think indexing will, it's just, yeah, I, I think indexing has, has a lot of legs. There's a lot of, a lot of power behind it at, at this point. And, um, and the other thing that I'll, I'll say, seeing as you brought it up is, um, Jack Vogel was a fiscal saint. As, mm -hmm. as I call him. I mean, it's just incredible the gift that he gave to individual investors before he created Vanguard and index funds. Uh, if you were going to invest, you went through a stockbroker, you paid commissions in and out, or you bought an actively managed fund and paid extraordinarily high fees. Now actively managed funds are, you can get them at, you know, half a percent or, mm -hmm. you know, but Back in the day, they were routinely three, four percent a year. You know, so that competition from index investing has made even active investing more, uh, more competitive. And yeah, every now and again, somebody will will compare me to Jack Bogle or or put me on on the the same level as as Bogle. And I uh, I say, you know, um, Jack Bogle was a white hot sun. And I'm a flickering candle in comparison. I mean, he created the stuff. I write about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. but, but he's the guy who gifted it to all of us. So, yeah, huge kudos. That's beautiful. Like we say in the opening of each episode, there's so much more to money than saving it, spending it, and investing. So I wanted to know JL's thoughts on community, about his wife, and his motivations for charitable giving. You know... The gushy stuff. I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk kind of about the purpose of all of this, the more like gushy side, community, family, friends, love, all of that stuff. Um, oh, you have the wrong guest. <laughs> <laughs> we always talk about community being the superpower and the secret mm -hmm. sauce of how we've been able to be investors and consistent for so long. Can you tell us a little bit about Chautauqua and why you do it and what makes it so special? Well, yeah, Chautauqua was, uh, the origin story of Chautauqua was going, goes way back to, I started the blog in 2011. And in 2012, I, I started thinking, you know, I kind of like writing about this stuff and I'm getting a pretty good uh, response and uh, I've always liked public speaking and so I started looking around to see if there was some venue where I could uh, you know I could participate as a speaker and I couldn't find one and so I I created it and my concept behind it was you know I, I want it was purely selfish by the way uh, <laughs> I you know, I wanted to get together with cool people and I wanted to go to some cool exotic place and I wanted to have cool conversations. All of those things, of course, defined by what I think is cool. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of conversations I think are cool, you know, and the, and I, you know, when, when I did the first Chautauqua, which was in Ecuador in, in 2013, I mean, I didn't know if anybody would show up uh, because there was nothing else out there in the FI community at the time, or at least nothing that I found other than FinCon was, was, mm -hmm. was still there. And, um, and people did, you know, and we limit one of the, one of the key things about Chautauqua, a couple of key things, uh, we limit the number of attendees, you know, it was, oh, it's only 30 and that makes it a very intimate group and it lasts for a week. So you really get to know each other in the course mm -hmm. of that week. But it, you know, I didn't know if people would show up and it, I forget how long it took to fill those first 30 seats, but I don't know, six, eight weeks, something like that, you know? So for six, eight weeks, I'm kind of on pins and needles and then finally it fills up, it sells out. And my first thought was, what if I hate these people? <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be stuck, for a stuck with, for, with people I might hate. It's yours. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> and, uh, and of course, like, you know, I get to Ecuador, and and it was an incredibly incredible group of people. 
and uh, incredibly diverse group of people, by the way, which I hadn't given any thought to. You know, I was just hoping somebody would sign up, you know. And <laughs> But I, I was amazed at, at the diversity of people that came. And I mean that on at every level. It was certainly racial diversity, sexual orientation, age, levels of wealth. Uh, you, know, you know, it's mostly Americans and still is, but international. There's a sprinkling, sprinkling of international people that came. And once I recognized that, and I, I happen to like that myself, so then when I would start talking about Chautauqua, I would make it a point of, of making that, that it was a very diverse group because I wanted to encourage people to come, you know, that, that regardless of what their background was, I, I wanted them to know it would be a place that they would be welcome. So that's that, that part of it has continued. But it sort of put a lie to the to the uh, image that was starting to develop in those days. This was just for white male engineers. And that's never been my experience. I mean, I'm a white male, but I'm not an engineer. And there are certainly white male engineers in the space. Uh, my friend Pete, Mr. Money Mustache, being, being a good example. But that was not what showed up at, at should talk with that first time. And that's really never been my experience of the community. It's always been much broader. And that continues to this day. So, and I, and I think in a way that, that the secret sauce of Chautauqua turned out to be that there are filters that were not consciously put there. But one filter is that, you know, it is in some exotic place. So it's not easy to get to. You know, we go to nice places and it's not cheap. So, you know, you have to be willing to travel. It's a certain financial commitment. So obviously nobody is coming to this thing unless they really are interested in the subject. Other than, and this was also uh, unanticipated, what we've come to identify as dragged along spouses. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we do get a few of those. And gratifyingly, every single one of the uh, of the dragged along spouses who come sort of, oh, this is going to be a week of boring financial people talking about boring number stuff. And, you know, I, I, I love this person, but why is he or she dragging me to that? You know, they all have a great time because it's much more than those. When I say cool conversations, it's just not around spreadsheets. Yeah, you know, we yeah. talk about all kinds of things, you know, life and, you know, struggles and getting there and what to do once you get there. And, you know, it's, it's a great community. And somebody pointed out to me just recently that people who have been to Chautauqua love being able to call themselves Chautauquans. Hmm. And I had noticed that, but it never, it just somehow never clicked to me that, 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 that was, you know, cause it's a community they can now identify with. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> Um, when we first reached out to you, and this is kind of in the same vein of this conversation about community, but when we first reached out, um, you said these days you're you're recommending sort of in exchange for an interview that people consider making a donation to a nonprofit organization. And uh, we love that because even as we were on our book tour, um, with every city that we went to, we were selling tickets. Uh, but the goal was to really raise money for organizations, nonprofit organizations in each city that were really doing their part in really unique and quality focused ways to fight food insecurity around the country. Um, I wanted to ask, like, was there something about that organization or is there just something about you and wanting to be a, sort of a vessel for amplifying uh, issues that are important to you or that are important in your local community. Uh, but like why that organization, why that approach? And just like, you know, how do you feel about kind of incorporating uh, giving into your overall wealth building? Um, so uh, my requesting people to make a donation when I, when I give these interviews um, came out in, trying to remember exactly when, but at one point I, I was uh, invited to, to give a talk uh, to a large corporate organization. And they, and I had never 
I'd never asked for money before, and I'd never thought of doing this as being a paid thing. And they, and they said, oh, by the way, we're going to pay you $5,000. And I, I love being paid for my work, make, make no mistake. I mean, I'm a capitalist to my toenails. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, I, I didn't quite feel comfortable with it for some reason. And I didn't feel comfortable taking money from them if I wasn't going to be taking it from everybody else. And, and I didn't feel comfortable saying all of a sudden, okay, now, you know, if you want to interview me, you got to pay. But I did feel comfortable about saying, well, you know, why don't you send your $5,000 to this organization? And then it just occurred to me, and I don't require this, by the way. I mean, I give, I try to say yes to people who ask me to, to, uh, to chat with me because I enjoy doing it and I'm honored to be asked. And then I'll just put it out there. And, and most people, you know, are like, like you guys are, wow, that's a cool idea. We're happy to do it. Um, so that's kind of the origin of it. Uh, you know, I, I think that in terms of, of giving in general, uh, you know, one of, and I, and I think this is pretty universal in my experience. Maybe it's the kind of people you meet in the FI community or what have you, but, but my observation is that people who become wealthy become generous. Hmm. Uh, I know that's counter to the stereotype, but that's my observation. And again, it, it, in some ways, it's a selfish drive because for me, and I bet a lot of people would say this, there is nothing that is selfishly more gratifying to do with my money than to to, to give it away. And, you know, I, that might sound disingenuous in some ways, but it's true. I mean, say, you know, the, the, I, I like to think that when I give money, it benefits the people who are on the receiving end, but it benefits me at least as much in terms of the satisfaction that I, that I get. So, um, you know, for instance, we, we drive a Subaru. And, and, you know, Subaru is a very nice car. You know, for another $40,000, we could have been driving, we could be driving a Mercedes. And we could afford to do that. And I want to do what's best for me and makes me feel best. And, you know, what makes me feel best is driving the Subaru and giving the rest of the money away. Mm-hmm. And I don't say that to make make me sound like, oh, I'm such a wonderful, generous person. Selfishly, that's what's best for me, you know? Yeah. And uh, anyway, and then the final thing, uh, the organization uh, that I ask people to donate to, that's it's one I've been supporting for a number of years. It's very small. It's based out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. It's called Adopt a Native Elder. Mm-hmm. And uh, they do most of their work on the Navajo Reservation. Uh, and it's exactly what it sounds like, uh, you know, people on the, on the Navajo reservation are, it's a huge, huge reservation, small population. They are spread out. Um, uh, many of the elderly out there or the elders, uh, live alone and they live in poverty, uh, frequently in Hogan's that don't have running water and that kind of thing. And this organization uh, brings food, water, firewood. Uh, they'll bring um, uh, yarn and thread because a lot of these elders are craftspeople. And then they'll make rugs and, and other mm-hmm. things that the organization will then sell, take and sell on their behalf and bring the money back to them. And, and um, it's just, you know, it's, very highly ranked on Charity Navigator. It gets the absolute highest ranking. So they're very efficient in the way they use the money. Um, Again, it's very small. And um, yeah, I mean, Linda and her team just do really, really good work in a community that, in in a part of the community that just has a pretty desperate need. Mm So uh, yeah, and that's, you know, there's lots of wonderful charities out there. That's just one that, it happens to speak to me for whatever reason. I love that. Um, I want to talk about your wife for a split <laughs> second, because aside from index fund investing, who you choose to marry is one of the most important 
financial decisions one can make in their life. And so I want to know, is she as passionate about index funds as you are, or is she more kind of indifferent and that's your thing? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the short answer is she's kind of indifferent and this, it's my thing. But uh, she and I are very much in line when it comes to how we think about money. I mean, we are, you know, we're both sort of inherently frugal. I remember I, I was... I forget, we were somewhere, we were talking to somebody about something and and uh, they asked a question like, well, so, you know, did you guys talk a lot about money when you were dating before you get married, you got married and, you know, did you know you were on the same wavelength? And I said, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, we didn't. I think we just got extraordinarily lucky I and mean, I never considered those conversations and then we got married and it just turns out that we were on the same wavelength and, and, uh, and Jane looks at me, what are you talking about? <laughs> on our first date, you told me I needed to save 50% of my income. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, oh. I, I don't remember that. I mean, I'm sure it's true. I mean, cause I can hear myself <laughs> hearing that. Sounds like something I'd say. <laughs> it definitely sounds like me. <laughs> but I but I was walking around with this idea in my head that no, we never talked about it. We just got lucky. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh that's God. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so but we did get lucky. She's not interested in the event. So in our house, she spends the money and I invest the money. And um uh, She's not particularly interested in the investment side, and I'm not particularly interested in the spending side. <laughs> yeah. And and she's, uh, uh, you know, she's very, you know, I'm I'm lucky to be married to a woman who, you know, when we have money conflicts, it's me saying spend more, spend mm. more. You know, you can, and I, I can't. I've lost that battle. I can't get her to do that, but. But yeah, yeah, so she's very, very, she's an excellent shopper. She's very careful with the money and, and what have you. And uh, that's worked out okay. well. Now, one of the things I will say in, in all seriousness, um, to everybody listening, I think in most marriages, in most cases, there there's one couple who's kind of handles the finances and then the other one, not so much. And I have a very good friend of mine who, uh, won't you about, probably five, six years ago now, died suddenly at the age of 57. Picture of health. I mean, this guy was, you know, lean, strong. If you had told me I was going to outlive Joe, I would have bet everything I had and borrowed money to bet more. So we just never know. And it was a traditional marriage in the sense that Joe handled all the money and his wife, mm -hmm. Debbie, didn't have a clue. And when he, and they had a really good marriage. So, of course, that was very traumatizing for her to lose her husband. But at the same time, I remember she said to me, you know, I have no idea if I can stay in the house. I have no idea what we have. And so she's faced in this moment of incredible grief, mm -hmm. having to figure out the really basic things with no background, no training. So one of the things that Jane and I do, and I highly recommend it, is anytime I do things with our investments, she's sitting next to me while I do it, and we walk through it together, and we talk about it a lot. So she's not particular, and she, I don't think she particularly enjoys that. It's not a level of interest, but she appreciates the importance of it, and so she always is happy to participate. So, you know, she knows what we have, where we have it and why we have it and, you know, if we change anything, why we're changing it. And the other thing I, I will say on that subject is one of the other beauties of uh, the simple path to wealth by, is that we own very little. I mean, we, you know, we own two, two uh, funds, right? We own VTSAX and we own a bond fund and, and we have a money market fund and a couple of checking accounts that, banks to pay the bills and that's it. So she's not going to have to sort through a whole bunch of individual stocks if I drop dead or 
actively manage funds and try. She's not going to have to change anything once, mm. you know, if, in, if I die. I mean, it's just everything is, and, and we talk about that. So you're not going to have to do a thing. It's just, it's, it's all that. And, and that's the other reason we were talking earlier about my, you know, my, my addiction to individual stocks. One of the things that keeps me from, from fooling around with them now, because uh, in some ways it would be fun, is that, you know, if I do that, then I am leaving her a burden. If I mm. happen to die when these things are sitting here, because she's going to be looking at them, what am I supposed to do with this stuff? You know, and if you own an individual stock, you always have to be thinking about when do you get rid of it? Because going exactly. back to, to what Mr. 1500 points out, you know, companies come and go very few. I think it's, he said something like a one in 200 lasts yeah. for a long time. So anyway. I never considered that. That's actually a really good point. I'm it is, add that right? to my argument arsenal. <laughs> it's yeah. like, what happens if you fall over and die? Like, right. no one can manage that for you. Yeah, what's the burden you're leaving behind? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that, of course, opens your spouse up to, you know, to all the, the charlatans that, mm -hmm. that, that that are ready to pounce. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and so suddenly they're going to be getting all this advice and they don't know. Uh, why you own what the investment you own, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to be easy to say, well, you, know, you should start trading options, you know? Yeah. And the next thing you yeah. know, there goes the money. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you are also quite the world traveler, right? So in addition to just leisurely wandering around the world, you also have this event with Chautauqua where you're, uh, where you tend to sounds like attract people from all around the world. I'm curious if you have, found any parts of the world or countries or cultures in particular that are, uh, let's say, more prone to the FI or financial independence way of life relative to Americans? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I think actually uh, Americans, this is, this is kind of an, uh, an American phenomenon, I think, at least in mm -hmm. its origins. Uh, I, I think it's certainly spread around the world, you know, uh, so my book, for instance, has been translated into 20 different languages, uh, you know, in, I mean, all over Europe, certainly, but also India, China, Japan, uh, I, you know, I lose, I, I mean, I, I kind of lose track in Brazil. So, I mean, it is, it is something that's spreading all over the world, but I, I think the, you know, the, the most dominant country in this, in this space is still, is still the U S now I'm hesitating a little bit because that might be my own biases because this is where I am and mm -hmm. this is where my audience tends to be, you know, the bulk of it. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the bulk of people who come to Chautauqua are Americans. That's shifting. I mean, every year it's, it's a, it gets, gets to be a little more international than it was the year before. But I, I'm thinking we were in Columbia this year, and I'd say 70% are still Americans, you know. But, but we've had people from all over the world. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've had... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we've had people from every continent except uh, Antarctica. I don't know what's wow. wrong with those penguins, but they haven't shown up. <laughs> yeah. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Cashing Out the Podcast. To see more videos like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to turn on your notifications. To get your copy of Cashing Out the Book, visit Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore, or download the audiobook on Audible.